Welcome to the Objectivism Store's audio presentation of The Intrinsic, The Subjective, and The Objective by David Ross. At the Objectivist Center's 2001 Summer Seminar, Dr. Ross offered this engaging overview of one of Ayn Rand's most important contributions to philosophy, the objective, subjective, intrinsic trichotomy. Objectivity is under attack from many directions today. But what is objectivity, and what viewpoints stand opposed to it? Informing her philosophy of objectivism, Ayn Rand insightfully identified intrinsicism and subjectivism as the two essential philosophical approaches that stand against the objective approach. Using examples from cinema, biology, ethics, and the culinary arts, Dr. Ross presents the basics of intrinsicism and subjectivism, both as philosophical approaches and as thinking styles. And he demonstrates how this distinction is useful in identifying philosophical and psychoepistemological errors, as well as in elucidating the nature of objectivity itself. David Ross received his PhD in mathematics from New York University and presently is associate professor of mathematics at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Formerly a mathematician at Kodak Research Labs, he's the author of Mathematical Models in Photographic Science, holds several patents, and has been a frequent lecturer at previous summer seminars. In the film Terminator Part 2, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays an android sent from the future to protect a young boy who is destined to be a great military leader. Great flick. Another android has been sent to kill the boy. A sub-theme of this film is the development of ethical awareness. Arnold is inclined to kill anyone he needs to in order to protect the kid. The kid tells Arnold he can't do this. You can't just go around killing people. Why? asks Arnold. What do you mean, why? Because you can't. Why? Because you just can't, OK? Trust me on this. <laughs> Throughout the film, there's no explanation of why killing is bad. There's no real evidence presented. Still, in the end, Arnold gets it. The film ends in a voiceover. If a machine, a Terminator, can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. This is intrinsicism. <laughs> the view that abstract ideas are self-evident. They exist as such out in the world, and the process of grasping them is a direct, perception-like experience. Evidence and argument are irrelevant. Things just are a certain way, and you just get it. This example has two of the most common features of intrinsicism as it's practiced. The word just, <laughs> some highly abstract idea, just is true, and the appeal to authority. Trust me on this. The film Night of the Living Dead opens with Barbara and her brother visiting a cemetery where her brother is attacked by a flesh-eating zombie. <laughs> Barbara flees to a local farmhouse. She learns from news reports, from testimony of others holed up in the farmhouse, and from direct perceptual evidence. Some graphic direct perceptual evidence, if you've seen this film. <laughs> that due to a radiation accident, newly dead people are coming back to life as cannibalistic monsters. Her brother is dead at best. <laughs> at worst, he's one of the living dead. She refuses to face this fact, insisting, contrary to massive evidence, that Johnny is fine. Johnny eventually shows up at the door. Barbara runs to him. He and some other ghouls devour her. This is subjectivism. <laughs> The view that the world will conform to your ideas, that what you think is true is true because you think it. This example shows a common feature of subjectivism as it's practiced, which is it, it's based on emotions. Facing the facts would be just too emotionally painful. Ayn Rand wrote that consciousness as an active process consists of two essentials, differentiation and integration. Our senses do this automatically. At the conceptual level, differentiations and integrations are no longer automatic, but they are absolutely essential. Making accurate differentiations while keeping uh, our integrations broad enough for unit economy is fundamental to objectivity. The concept of objectivity 
as David pointed out, is central to objectivism. It's the attribute that characterizes proper thinking. As with any concept, to understand objectivity, we'll have to differentiate its reference from other commensurable things, right? Which means differentiating it from other styles of thinking. This is the most important purpose of the concepts intrinsicism and subjectivism. And I want to say, I think these, uh, among the many brilliant things that Rand did, uh, the identification of this trichotomy is, is absolutely a central, crucial uh, bit of brilliance from her. So intrinsicism and subjectivism are two broad classes of philosophical theories, and they ha there are two broad classes, associated classes, of psychoepistemological styles uh, that Ayn Rand uh, invented to identify, it. she didn't invent them, identified in order to help us understand objectivity. Now, a secondary and important purpose uh, of understanding intrinsicism and subjectivism is to help us classify uh, and thus understand certain philosophical and psychoepistemological errors. With this in mind, I want to anticipate a, a, an objection to my uh, presentation today. I'm going to present and discuss intrinsicism and subjectivism uh, I'll give uh, explicit formulations of some of the uh, aspects of intrinsicism and subjectivism that few hold in explicit form. Okay, I'll present them with a level of consistency that no actual intrinsicist or subjectivist would ever uh, buy into. Okay. Uh, finally, you should keep in mind that while we are going to be contrasting intrinsicism and subjectivism, with objectivity, this is not what an intrinsicist or a subjectivist would do. Right? One of the causes of their errors is that they think intrinsicism and subjectivism, or at least they think implicitly that intrinsicism and subjectivism are the only two options. Okay? Finally, we should be clear on a slightly technical point, which is that in common parlance, these terms get thrown around a lot of different ways. In particular, what we call intrinsicism, when we say, we use the term intrinsic, is what a lot of people, in particular non-objectivists, would often call objective. Okay, so they might, see, they might see it as an objective, subjective dichotomy, whereas we see it as a trichotomy, and what they mean by objective, we mean by intrinsic. So I don't want to use, uh, be making a straw man argument against philosophical positions that require, and in some cases deserve, subtler ex explication and analysis. I just want to characterize these broad philosophical and psychoepistemological tendencies so we can understand objectivity and avoid errors. So the movie examples that I gave you focus on ethical subjectivism and intrinsicism. This is the context in which intrinsicism and subjectivism are most familiar. Generally, the religious approach to ethics is intrinsic, right? it's an intrinsicist approach, and the relativist, relativist approach to ethics, which is associated with the political left these days, tends to be subjectivist. If you want to get a good dose of intrinsicism, you can do it any day by turning on the radio and listening to Dr. Laura, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, she's unbelievable uh, in that. And if you want a good dose of uh, ethical subjectivism, go to college. <laughs> <laughs> Ethics is the subject that matters most in one sense, right? It's the subject that establishes the principles of living well, and that's what it's all about. Okay. But in another sense, in the sense of causal fundamentality, ethics is derivative. It depends, as do all subjects, on epistemology. The correctness of one's views on any subject are limited by the correctness of the methods one uses to arrive at them. Uh, even when one uses proper logical methods, care and uh, an effort are required if you want to get the right answers. Flawed approaches like intrinsicism and subjectivism are doomed from the start. So, as objectivists, we're interested in convincing others that a political system based on individual rights and the cultural values of independence, productivity, rationality are good. If we want to eliminate bad ideas, we have to know what causes them. And what causes them is epistemology. If an, intrinsic, if an intrinsicist environmentalist argues to you that the snail darter or the spotted owl 
must be preserved at any cost because species diversity is intrinsically valuable. What you have is not an argument over politics or environmentalism. What you have is fundamentally an epistemological disagreement. If a subjectivist social theorist says that proper education, and I'm quoting here from Paolo Freire, a sort of postmodern education theorist, that proper education, quote, denies that the world exists as a reality apart from men, unquote, what you have is an epistemological debate, not a debate over pedagogy. So I'm going to start out with some examples of, intrin of intrinsicism and subjectivism in various fields. Right? <laughs> Metaphysics, cooking, and physics. Okay. I don't think Aristotle actually put cooking in between metaphysics and physics. But. <laughs> start here. So Will Thomas, who's sitting in the audience, was visiting me once, and he got to talking with one of my neighbors, we had a sort of shindig at night, about religion. And she was amazed that Will and my wife and I uh, are atheists. How can you not believe in God? She asked Will. He gave a characteristically objectivist reply. Well, you, you'd have to explain to me, he said, what, what God is. Uh, why should you think there is such a thing? What's your evidence? What why do you think there is a God? She said, without hesitation, because I don't want this to be all there is. I don't want my life to just end. This is the subjectivist approach to the metaphysical question. Okay? Now, she's a member of an organized religion. Uh, those of you who have heard John Bechtel lecture know that her religion is a very organized religion. <laughs> her subjectivist honesty on, is not the position of her religion or of most religions on this topic. They generally appeal to faith. This is the intrinsicist approach to the issue. You can become certain on topics like, uh, like the existence of God without evidence or argument through the ineffable mechanism of faith. Now, I have a quote here. This is a quote from the Second Vatican Council. And they're quoting the First Vatican Council. Was, we're quoting St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, so we've got the authorities stacked up. <laughs> this is a great quote. The obedience of faith must be given to God. If this faith is to be shown, the grace of God must assist moving the heart, opening the eyes of the mind, giving ease to everyone in assenting to the truth. Through divine revelation, God chose to share those treasures which totally transcend the understanding of the human mind. Now, there's two important things to note here. The first is the phrase, opening the eyes of the mind. This is the essence of intrinsicism, the idea that the mechanism for acquiring abstract knowledge should be automatic, like perception. So, I've never seen it in a more naked form than this. Second, that awareness, quote, transcends understanding, unquote. So there's no method by which we can uh, get this knowledge. That's metaphysics. Now we're into the kitchen. <laughs> Sometime around the fourth grade, students seem to learn that tomatoes are fruit and not vegetables. Remember learning that? You felt you were pretty smart. I did. <laughs> In the horticultural sense, of course, they are fruit. They're the developed ovaries of a seed plant. And the next time mom points to the tomatoes on the dinner plate and says, eat your vegetables, the little fourth grader replies, that's wrong. They're not a type of vegetable. They're a type of fruit. I, I don't know if my daughters are listening. <laughs> now, in the culinary context of middle America, vegetables are bits of plants, usually salty, bitter, or bland things that one eats grudgingly as part of the main meal. <laughs> Fruits are sweet bits of plants that one eats willingly, eagerly even, for dessert and snacks. This is an objective basis for classifying tomatoes, spinach, eggplant, asparagus together, and differentiating them from bananas, pineapples, pears. The relevant classification depends on context. Again, horticultural or culinary. 
The little kid, the little fourth grader, in insisting that they are fruit and not vegetables, is being a little intrinsicist. Admittedly, the other end of the intrinsicist spectrum from the Second Vatican Council. <laughs> he is harmlessly, in this case, dropping the context. If the kid's 15-year-old sister is at the table, she's likely to chime in. You can call them fruit. Mom can call them vegetables. I could call them socket wrenches. It's completely arbitrary. What's true for one person may not be true for another person. You remember when you got to that stage too, right? <laughs> so I want to call your attention to the fact that in this tomato example, the intrinsicist in my little example is a child. The subjectivist is an adolescent. I think this reflects a certain trend in psychological and cognitive development, at least it did in mine. As a young child, you're told, this is a car. This is a cat. This is wrong. Right? You're not aware of any subtleties of context, hierarchy. Right? When you reach adolescence and you become more reflective, more self-aware, you realize that you have a certain amount of choice in cognitive matters. Right? Uh, and you may, uh, you may swing away from intrinsicism and towards subjectivism. I think, that's, I think a lot of people do that and never swing anywhere else. Okay, last example, physics. Okay. During the first part of last century, physicists discovered that electrons and other subatomic constituents of matter behave in some contexts like particles and in some contexts like waves. Right? They, account, they are like particles in the sense that if you try to detect them with some sort of sensor, they arrive discreetly, sort of plop, 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 like water dripping from a faucet. In other contexts, they behave like waves. They're like waves in the sense that they exhibit interference patterns in a way that I won't get into here. <laughs> but they exhibit interference patterns like waves on water. A thing can't be both a particle and a wave. Right? The properties of these two things, some of the properties contradict one another. Uh, and as you know, the conundrum related uh, to this wave-particle duality is at the root of quantum mechanics and the immense philosophical debate that's it's stimulated. An intrinsicist approach to this paradox, now I've known people who took this, might be to say that the electrons must be, or would be, to say that the electrons must be either particles or waves. They either have the abstract essence particle or they have the abstract essence wave. Right? And you just have to, somehow, somehow, we've got to figure out which. The subjectivist says, well, I told you so. You were wrong to expect that things have identities in the first place. If you want examples of this, read books like The Dancing Wu Li Masters. I don't know if anyone has read this popular book explaining, comparing uh, quantum mechanics and Eastern mysticism. Several of these books. Oh, 20 years ago or so. A uh, quote from that book, physics is the study of the structure of consciousness. <laughs> Objectivity in this matter says, well, we're in a whole new context, aren't we? In the realm of really, really small dimensions. It would have made things simple if the concepts we formed at larger dimensions simply went over directly, but they don't. I knew that was possible. I understood the contextuality of my concept formation when I did it. I guess I'll have to form new concepts or perhaps extend and alter some of the concepts that I have in order to account for the new, newly discovered facts in this new context. So those are my three opening examples, metaphysics, kitchen, and physics. I'm going to start off then with a discussion of objectivism, the objectivist account of the nature of knowledge, focusing on objectivity. Then I'm going to move on to intrinsicism and subjectivism with the objectivist theory as a context for understanding the other two. Let's start with the nature of knowledge. What is it? What is knowledge? Thinking, what is it? How do we do it? To discuss these matters, we need a starting place. One of the cornerstones of objectivism is the recognition that there is a starting place, not an arbitrary one, a given objective, absolute starting place. Perception. We're aware of things persistently, unstoppably. Light enters our eyes, 
and we're aware of colored blocks, moving creatures, buildings, flowers. Pressure waves are incident upon our eardrums, and we're aware of footsteps, bells ringing, voices. Of course, at the basic level, we're not aware of these things as flowers and footsteps. Our direct experience of the world is given. It's not something we can invoke, and it's not something we can stop, I mean, short of death. Our direct perceptual awareness of the world is the basic fact, ground zero. It's unavoidable and in the deepest sense, undeniable. The acquisition of knowledge is the organization of our perceptual experiences. Thinking is how we perform this organization. Perceptual, perceptual experience is literally an endless, mind-bogglingly numerous stream of unique particulars. Just consider the things in your visual field right now, and consider how many such distinct visual, visual fields you encounter in the course of a single day. By organizing these experiences conceptually, knowledge, in David Kelly's definition, is awareness in conceptual form, we collapse the number of things we must deal with immensely. We stack them up neatly, we cross-reference them, we cross-reference them according to criteria that matter, and using, these, this organized, using this organization, we can navigate the world. Before, I argued that ethics, like all subjects, depends on epistemology. However, there's some basic ethical issues at the foundation of knowledge, and this is, uh, again, a, a sort of Something that's, if not unique to objectivism, it's certainly characteristic of and important to objectivism. Contra Plato and even Aristotle, objectivism recognizes that we don't pursue knowledge as an end in itself. We organize our experiences conceptually so that we can understand the world and so that we can live successfully in it. Our purposes, our needs, shape our conceptual organization. The average person, as an example, has perhaps 20 color concepts. An interior designer may have hundreds. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of buying Venetian blinds, <laughs> right? And they come with this incredible, these named colors. We have principles for driving automobiles, but we have no such principles for zipping through the skies with our Buck Rogers jetpacks. Not yet. So that is my broad outline of knowledge. It's the conceptual organization of our direct, that is perceptual, experience of reality. And that organization is shaped by our purposes, by the requirements of our lives. As we go on to talk about more specifics of the objectivist epistemology, I'll try to show how these reflect the basic view of, this basic view of the nature of knowledge and its acquisition. I think that this basic view provides an integrating theme that can help us understand more specific issues. Okay, so we want to get on to the two fundamental theses of uh, objectivist epistemology. Let me get that outlined here. And the first, uh, first of the two main pillars of objectivist epistemology is the primacy of existence. The objects of awareness exist and are what they are independent of our awareness of them. Okay? Consciousness is awareness of this independently existing world. The primacy of existence is axiomatic. It's not a particular feature of reality, uh, not a particular feature of which we're aware. It's, the proposi it's a propositional foundation of the, of the basic given fact that we are aware of things. It's literally undeniable because the act of denying it will be an affirmation of something, and thus an affirmation of the fact of the awareness of things. Okay? This property of axioms, their undeniability, is called the self-refutation property. We'll have occasion to consider it in our discussion of uh, intrinsicism and subjectivism. Now, there's often confusion about axioms, about their purpose in logic according to objectivism. One reason is the objectivist view of knowledge as the conceptual organization of perceptual experience is simply alien to much of the rest of the culture. Another reason that there's confusion is the term axiom is, the most, is most well known in, con, uh, in connection with formal deductive systems. 
in which an axiom is one of the basic statements from which others are deduced. I have to admit, of course, my field of mathematics is one of the sort of the, the classic example in which we use axioms in this uh, term axiom in this way. This is not what objectivist <laughs> axioms are. The axioms do not dictate the content of knowledge. That comes from perception. Right? The axioms summarize in the broadest form the method for organizing knowledge. The axiom of existence reminds us that reality is the source of data, the only source of data. If we find ourselves looking to a supernatural realm, if we find ourselves making things up out of whole cloth, this axiom reminds us that we're wrong. The axiom of identity in the form of the law of non-contradiction tells us that if we find ourselves regarding something as, say, wet and dry at the same time and in the same respect, we've made a mistake. The axiom of consciousness, specifically the fact that consciousness is identification, tells us that if we start thinking that reality will conform to our ideas, we're wrong. The second fundamental thesis uh, is the identity of the mind. The mind is a real thing like any other. And like any other real thing, it has an identity. What's this identity like? Well, it has volition, the capacity to focus attention. It receives perceptual data. It has the capacity to attend selectively to heighten focus on some aspects of something and diminish attention to others. It has the capacity to abstract, to perform deductive inferences, to imagine. The mind's capacity for attending to particular things is limited. Short and long-term memory are limited. The speed with which we can make inferences is limited. The mind is fallible. The mind has an identity. I want to make one point on this topic to try and make it clear. I think this is, again, an absolutely crucial point in objectivism, and a much misunderstood one. Religious folks often talk about, their, about faith, I mentioned it earlier, as a means for ascertaining mystical insights. Uh, it's important to note that if faith were real, if there really were such a faculty, it would have a definite identity. Right? There would be a way to invoke it. People are always telling you to invoke it. Have faith. Right? There'd be a way to do that if it were real. Right? There'd be a way to lose it. People are always saying, you lost faith. What'd I do? <laughs> right? An absolutely essential feature of the notion faith is that its would-be reference have no identity. Okay. As much as you hear advocates, its advocates talk about it, you'll never hear them say anything definite about its workings. Now, I have a colleague who's a Christian fundamentalist. Uh, she and I have talked about religion. She's explained, explained. She's told me I have to have faith. All right, I told her one day, after years of talking with her on and off about this, tell me what to do. I am the best proselyte possible. You know that. You know if you ask me to read something, I'll read it, and I'll think carefully about it. If you ask me to do some exercises, you know I'll really do it. And if you convert Ross, <laughs> think of the points with the big guy. <laughs> I, I, I'll get back to you, she said. <laughs> now, that was almost 10 years ago. <laughs> and I, I don't want to point out this, th I, I don't mean, well, I do mean to ridicule this poor woman. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I don't simply want to do that. This is, a, this is a serious woman who's thoughtful about, to some degree, about her religion. Right? She's, she, she's certainly not a, an obvious crackpot. But she's never going to get back to me because there's nothing for her to tell me. Right? There's, there's no mechanism that she can tell me of how to invoke this thing she wants me to do. Okay. So, for those of you familiar with David Kelly's work, the would-be faith, like all such would-be means of revelation, fits the diaphanous model. Okay. So, next I want to move on to logic. So far I've talked about epistemology, philosophical theory of the nature of knowledge. 
Now we want to get on to logic, which is the actual method we use to acquire knowledge. Most of you learned uh, in college about modern logic, by which, again, my field is uh, sort of a locus for modern logic, mathematics. And uh, by modern logic, we mean the study of formal, uh, formal structure of deductive systems. Okay? And these days, that view of what logic is more or less dominates. I will admit I went through a long period in college myself where I simply regarded that as what logic was. The objectivist view of logic is very different. Knowledge is our perceptual awareness of reality organized conceptually for a particular purpose to advance our lives. Logic is the method of doing this. The method is determined by the nature of the, by, by three things. By the nature of the content, reality. By the nature of the tool, our minds. And by the purpose, our lives. I want to see how logic uh, ref is reflected to see how logic reflects these three elements, I want to consider some objectivist logical principles and practices. Okay, so what we're going to do is make a short tour through logic right, and see how it reflects these three basic principles. Okay. First, integration. Integration is the practice of identifying connections among various ideas to make sure that they're consistent, not contradictory and to identify new similarities. Let me give an example. I solved some algebraic equations, more or less deductive process, to determine how long it takes three people working together to mow a half acre lawn. Okay, Typical, I've taught this sort of thing in colleges. Okay? I get the answer five weeks. <laughs> I've gotten this sort of answer. I mean, not when I do my calculation myself, but from students. <laughs> I then try to integrate this with what I know about lawns. That I've mowed, I personally have mowed half acre lawns in an hour or so. I know I've made a mistake. That's an example of integration. It's something that math students almost invariably do not do. Uh, the practice of integration reflects the identity of the mind, right? That is A. Specifically, the fact that it's fallible. Right? The particular inferences have to be checked. The fact that you deduced an inference that you could have made a mistake. It reflects reality as the source of knowledge. Things in reality have definite identities. They're non-contradictory. If you've gotten some of your ideas to correspond to reality, you can check new ideas against those. Okay. Okay. The second uh, logical principle, the concept raiser often and mistakenly, I'm pretty sure, known as Rand's razor, but Rand's razor of concepts, which is do not multiply concepts beyond necessity and don't integrate in disregard of necessity. My example here is the way in which the term greed is often used. Uh, it's an example of integration in disregard of necessity. Integration of things that really should be uh, distinguished. Uh, e greed is used to mean the evil of wanting lots of money or the evil of wanting lots of wealth. Right? And what's the distinction that's blurred there? It's the distinction between wanting to earn it and wanting to get it some other way. Right? It's an essential difference. It's an important difference. Okay? So the principle the, this, the concept raiser reflects the need to make efficient use of our limited conceptual capacity. It's based on our need to use knowledge to support our lives. Right? You've got so much storage space, you better use it efficiently. And to do so with a mind that has a certain identity. Next principle, context. The case of tomatoes that we discussed earlier and the case of electrons illustrate the logical role of context. I think that was, hope that was clear. In the electron example, we see how the awareness of context reflects the identity of the mind. You can't have knowledge of things that are in a context you've never encountered. Okay? In the case of tomatoes, the role of context reflects our lives as the purpose of knowledge. Conceptual classifications are not intrinsic in reality. If you're interested in cooking, it makes sense to group tomatoes along with asparagus. Right? Not with bananas. Okay, the next principle, 
Rand's question. Rand's question is, what are the facts of reality that give rise to this concept? Right? It's a question one's supposed to ask in trying to understand the basis in reality of any concept. An example here I have is, suppose a conservative tells you that obedience to authority and respect for conventional morality are good. He tells you that. And he will tell you that. Just ask him. <laughs> in order for his statement to even be meaningful, he'd have to be able to answer Rand's question to give an account of the type of thing he integrates with the concept good. Right? And why he has that concept, what the facts of reality that are that gave rise to it. This principle, Rand's question, most clearly reflects reality as the source of content. If you hold a valid concept, it must be an integration of real existence. Real existence that are differentiated from other things on an objective basis. The principle also reflects the identity of the mind. The answer to Rand's question will include the identification of a conceptual common denominator and, a, and an objective basis for differentiating within that CCD because that is how the mind is equipped to form concepts. All right, let's leave it uh, leave the discussion of logic at, at that. If anyone wants to see, talk about some of these others, you can ask me in the question period. 